Welcome, residents, aliens, and officers of the law to this, the 274th episode of an Unearthly Podcast, streaming live on the 19th of September, 2018, and featuring Big Finish the Condemned. Written by Eddie Robson and starring Colin Baker as the Doctor and India Fisher as Charlotte Charlie Pollard. I am your host for this season, Randy Ronson McCulloch. And with me on the panel tonight is our technical director, Mad Matt Winchell. Guess who got Crystal Pepsi again, and the chat won't load. Curse you, uh, Twitch. Curse you yet again. Bill Sylvia, the man in black. Here I am, rocked like a hurricane. Tim, the enchanter Sheridan. Akuna Matata. And as stated previously, Thomas Fireheart does not join us for audio adventures, so is not with us tonight. Shame. Yeah. Boo, boo. Shame. An interesting week for me. Uh, Aaron, the co-worker that Aaron gets a ride to work from, her car's tranny died on Monday. Or actually on Sunday. So I had to wind up driving her to and from work the last two days. And that's fixed now. And then our toilet broke on yesterday, and that's fixed now. And Trouble comes in threes, so what's next? And I have eaten at Cheesecake Factory more in the last week than should be possible while still holding a man card. <laughs> I just rewatched the um, the DBZA scene related to your first point last night, so that's my only response. Uh, to my first point? Yes. Uh, I do not believe the car identifies as male or female. Uh uh, Arg. I need to really go through and rewatch all of season three of DBZ Abridged now that it's done. Just <clears throat> sit down at one point and binge watch it. <laughs> I honestly have not had the time to do much of anything like that. So how's the week been for you guys? Apparently I've been trying to knock myself out. I've added an additional show. I've been trying to stream in the early afternoons. The oh. uh, run of a course line of gallery players is continuing to go very well. That's good. How about you, Bill? This was my first day since the start of the semester that I've spent enough time in my apartment to pick the pile of dirty clothes off the floor and properly sort it into ah. bags so that I can get the laundry done. Yeah, I need to do laundry myself because things have just been weird. Mm -hmm. uh, so our first trip to the Cheesecake Factory on Sunday, I didn't realize our waitress was one of those soda refill ninjas. Mm. Uh, you know the ones that don't even bother to ask if you want an additional drink and just keep yeah, refilling? Sir, yeah. yeah, and I was drinking iced tea. Now, I haven't had a lot of caffeine in the last year or so. So, so my the body... caffeine and liquid. <laughs> So my body didn't react well to having four large glasses of iced tea ah. in one sitting. And I didn't sleep that night. <laughs> and so the next day I have to drive them into work and I'm just, I hadn't slept that night and I swear to God, I'm just, I start crashing hard driving back from taking them to work. Meanwhile, uh, at this time of the, some, at this time of the year, I could have four large cups of coffee between nine o'clock and midnight and then pass out at one. Mm. Someone's that's gonna how... die of caffeine overdose. That's right. Just I think I think last night was the first night that I slept a solid six hours since in about four days. Well <laughs> My my body has been recovering um, from that, but it's it's a slow go. And just be careful with that because that's pretty much how I I, I spent my entire life on third shift, mm. and now I'm a heart patient. So, and I do believe the two might be related. All right. So on tonight's on tonight's show, we've got uh, the news and birthday. <laughs> um, I don't think we have any geek talk because none of us have any time. <laughs> Um, so then it's going to be the episode summary, our reviews, our final thoughts, and our ratings. And the train. So, oh, yeah. Uh, apparently there's train. Oh, uh, God. 
next year, Aaron and I may be moving away from railroad tracks, which would be nice. <laughs> as long as the kind... floods are done by then. Well, just as long as you're oh. on the right side of the tracks. So and on high ground. Picking up Aaron from, uh, on a related note from that, picking up Aaron from work last night, we decided to go down through downtown and see, because uh, we had heard on the radio that the roads were reopened. And that uh, Johnson Street, which is the major thoroughfare through uh, the downtown area of Madison across the Isthmus, was reopened after the rains had caused floods. Well, it was open, but barely. The lane Ooh. we were in still had about half a foot of water on it. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I was like, whoa! Yeah, one block in, and we're going to get off of this road now. Nope, 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 nope. That was the only area. It was basically about maybe 50 feet. Hmm. Hmm. It, it wasn't that big. It was over by where that lake is really close to the uh, to gotcha. the road. Hmm. But, yeah, it's... Um, that's an improvement from when it was raining a while back where University Avenue was untravelable. Um, Johnson Street, like I said, the major artery was untravelable because it was underwater. And, of course, there's whole t areas around here. Highway 14, which is a major highway in there, was closed uh, because the Black Earth Creek decided to start using Highway 14 as its actual uh, riverbank. <laughs> Um, Leave it we, to have Black friend, Earth. we have a friend by the name of Ed who lives out in Black Earth, and basically the river was going right by his front door. I um, think it ran by his front door and went into his basement. Oh, yes. Yeah, he was not father, exactly a happy camper about that, and I don't blame yeah, him. Yeah, his father lost $5,000 worth of rare comics. Mm. Like, like the original set of Infinity War and Infinity oh. Gauntlet. Mm, Secret shit. Wars 1, Secret Wars 2, and classic, like, 70s and 80s Fantastic Four. Oh, God, stab me in the heart. Yeah, because their, their basement went under, like, five feet of water. And they had just set up a reading area down there for the comics. Oh, <laughs> and that's got to get all cleaned now, too. Mm-hmm. Hope he had renter's insurance. Hope he had a lot of insurance. Um... Cause that's a lot yeah. of money he's out of now. Oh uh, no, he's just out of it. They did not have the, their renters' insurance didn't cover floods. Oh. Ooh. No, 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 no. That's that's Oops. terrible. Uh, f oh. uh, one of the hometowns from where I am, Gaze Mills. That's where I went to take swimming lessons. Flooded its banks, and um. Uh. About 10 years ago, they had had huge flooding that resulted in them moving part of the town to higher ground. Well, the flooding this year was worse than last year, and the new section also wound up getting flooded. I so think the entire they're... town needs to learn how to swim and swim out the hell out of that town. Yeah, the, the original main road uh, was it was the flooding was well over the first floors. Has, has it recovered since the photo you showed me, or is it about the same? Uh, well, uh, the flooding has gone down to an extent, but it's been raining here again, so I don't know what that's going to do to it. Gotcha. But uh, apparently a lot of the houses in the original part of Gaze Mills are total write-offs. They just, they cannot be cleaned. They have to be demolished and and rebuilt. So that town is going to change drastically. The, the flooding in the new area wasn't quite as bad. It was like a foot, two feet. And those, I think, are built now to be a little more flood resistant. So, hopefully, that's a change that 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 works out for the better. But we'll see. That's uh, Gaze Mills is kind of an iconic iconic town for that area because it's the home of seven apple orchards up on the bluff. Well, they're they're going to need to start growing rice. <laughs> Just about. Madison needs to do that because we're on a swamp. Anyway. Mm -hmm. So back to the uh, birthdays. We have one birthday uh, this week. It's the 19th of September. Tonight is the birthday of Carolyn John, who played Liz Shaw in oh. the 1970-1971 series. So, to so today, okay. She would have been 78, but unfortunately died in 2012 at the age of 71. 
That was a bad year for Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, not as bad as, what was it, like 2015? The one that was like deaths every week? Something like that? Every other week, just about, at but least. I just mean, in, in like, in that span, <clears throat> like 2011, 2012, was Carol Liz John, Liz Sladen, Nicholas Courtney. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was the heartbreaker year. Yeah, I think that was the year we were waiting for a doctor to die, and it didn't happen. Just because that would have been like the final cap on it, but mm-hmm. no, we got Tom, when we got Tom's we, an ornery bastard. Tom's an ornery got, bastard. And thank God for that because he's made out of steel and just won't give up right now. Knock on wood. There. He probably <laughs> plays chess with the Grim Reaper every night. <laughs> Um, so speak, speaking of death, uh, we're moving on to lost stories, and we have more than one this week. Whoa. Mm. AUP regrets to announce the death of Lovett Bickford, the director of the 1980 serial The Leisure Hive with Tom Baker, the first J&T produced story. Originally an assistant floor manager in the 1960s for episodes such as The War Machines and The Moon Base, his time as a director was fraught with difficulties, complications, and exasperation that resulted in his not returning to the series again. He also worked on other British staples such as Z Cars, or I guess they would say Z Cars, yes. Emmerdale Farm, and Angels. Lovett Bickford died on 29th July 2018 at the age of 76, and we're only hearing of it now. A service will be held on Monday, October 1st at St. Mary's Church in Battersea. All right. Um, yeah, I'm surprised that, you know, this happened in the 29th of July. And, and that we're we hearing only, about now? Yeah. In September? Yeah. Um, but I guess, the you know, the, the news transfers over really slowly from Battersea, which is, you know, way out in the boonies. I suppose. And I'm guessing that the difficulties, complication, and exasperation uh, had something to do with JNT. Or JNT and Tom Baker fighting it out. Uh, was... uh, yeah, apparently Tom was notoriously difficult for that episode. Yeah, oh, I yeah, think this is time. The, it was the whole time as director, so I imagine that would have been. There was a lot of things changing during that period, and not most of it was not congenial. Yeah, and, and Tom uh, was probably not having a lot of it, and yeah, yeah. he probably had tantrums. Well, he of course he wasn't time. having it. He quit. Well, he yeah, quit after he this. He didn't. Yeah, he didn't um, quit until the next season. This was the 1980 season. He didn't quit until the 1981 season. Mm-hmm. Um, so do we know when um, when Bickford's time as a director ended? He stopped he, after the Leisure Hive. It started oh, and stopped at oh, Leisure okay. Hive. Just Leisure Hive. Oh, he owned- <laughs> Yeah, it's like like I said, he had he had worked as an assistant floor director or floor right. manager before back in the sixties. Well, like it says his time as director that made it seem like it was an extended period. Well, it no. is an extended period for multiple weeks trying to film that bloody thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Um but yeah, um it's also very hard to find any information on this person because all of his like obituaries and stuff were like two lines. Mm. Moving on. Yep, moving on. We also regretfully announced the death of Zinnia Merton, who played Ping oh. Cho in the 1964 serial Marco Polo. She returned think... to the Doctor Who universe sorry, in 2009 as the registrar in The Wedding of Sarah Jane Smith. That's However, she is... in uh, the Sarah Jane Adventures, by the way. Wedding of... in the Sarah Jane Adventures. However, she is best known for playing Sandra Bennis in the 1970s Jerry Anderson series, Base 1999. Zania was bur- born. born in Myanmar, then Burma, to a Burmese native mother and a father of English-French dual nationality. Her first role was the Doctor Who one, but during her career she appeared in The Six Wives of Henry VIII and Jason King, as well as the 1971 Dennis Potter TV adaptation of Casanova. Later appearances include Grange Hill, Return of the Saint, Bergerac, Angels, Tenko, Dempsey and Makepeace, Lovejoy, Doctors, Casualty, EastEnders, The Bill, and Coronation Street. Hit all the big ones. Yeah. Leah Merton was 72. Yeah, she was was a staple of British acting. 
Apparently, and she started off as an unknown on Doctor Who. Go figure. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say she she was um, I've I'm trying to remember what superlative or whatever she had, but she was def she was one of the at least one of the earliest actors in Doctor Who to still be alive, possibly the only non companion co star to still be alive, like from that season, or at least the earliest. Well, that's because cause she Ping was in like the third or fourth uh, serial. Yeah, and Ping Cho was a, chi a teenage Chinese girl right. in that, so she was a young actress. Mm -hmm. She was, I think, the same age or around the same age as uh, Susan was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was supposed to be, <laughs> not yep. that, uh, not that uh, her actress was actually that age anymore. Yeah, I think she was a little younger than uh, Caroline Ford, but mm -hmm. the yeah. characters were about the the characters were both teenagers. Yeah. yeah, I remember that from the novel adaptation of Marco Polo. So that uh, they mentioned the fact that the two were like were the same age and thus managed to kind of get along very well. Mm-hmm. We'll have to note that when we actually review Marco Polo eventually. Mm -hmm. Although I am not looking forward to that. I have watched it once. I felt like ripping my eyes out. Yeah. Oh, You're gonna have to do those it. episodes. You're gonna have to do it again. It's one of those episodes it's it's uh it, it's one of those episodes that was supposed to be one of the greatest episodes when it aired, but now that there's no video mm -hmm. oh. it suffers and horribly. It was, uh... It was a very visual focused episode with a lot of elaborate sets and thing and costumes. Uh, and and elaborate like sets, elaborate costumes, just really good acting, the whole nine yards, and now none of it exists. Oh Possibly dear god. A sword fight, but I'm not entirely sure if I remember. I would, At least a couple, I, would, I think. No, I think the sword fight was from the Crusades. Hmm. Um, yeah, I know that definitely had one, but I couldn't remember if But it is still associated with a visually stunning episode nonetheless. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would love to see it get the ad the um, animation yeah, adaptation. Animation, but... Yeah. Okay, so moving on to our series eleven news. That would be me. So, we have more uh, information on the first two episodes of series eleven, including the titles. Last week we told you that the first episode was titled "The Woman Who Fell to Earth," and this week we get the Radio Times blurb for it. We don't get aliens in Sheffield. In a South Yorkshire city, Ryan Sinclair, Yasmin Khan, and Graham Bryan are about to have their lives changed forever as a mysterious woman, unable to remember her own name, falls from the night sky. Can they believe a word she says? And can she help solve the strange events taking place across the city? Guest starring Sharon D. Clark, Johnny Dixon, and Samuel Oatley, written by Chris Chibnall and directed by Jamie Child. Uh, All right. Also included are some new photos from episode one. Yep, and uh, those are kind of interesting. We see the first one with the doctor and companions looking at what looks to be a torn fence of some kind. We know it's from the first episode because we can still see the doctor in Capaldi's old outfit. Um, where are I these images? If you, look, if you look where it says link to... Link in parentheses to. by the title, yeah. Are those the new brainy specs? No, well, probably not I, on screen yet. But no, I don't think it's on screen yet. Oh, um. Oh, there we go. Jeez. Just said link to. I'm like, what? Where? What? When? <laughs> okay. Then I, what? I, when I do that, that just means that there's more than one article. That no, I didn't even see a link to. I'm like, where's a link to? What are you talking about? I had to find it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, I got the first one. Yep. They technically repeat that image twice, but the the top one's bigger. Um. Yeah. So I have no idea what's up with that, but it looks like something just tore through that fence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would I would think Cyberman or something, but A, it's too tall, and B, we know there's no repeating monsters this season. I was gonna say yeah, it looks like uh looks like it could have been a Yeti, but Yeah. Also, no repeating monsters. Right. Supposedly. So So we have no idea of that. The second one is a little more awesome. 
as we see Jodie Whittaker uh, basically probably just having finished completed her sonic screwdriver. Yep, which uh, which does uh, come you know uh, confirm the idea that she has to make this one as compared to the last two, which were just spit out by the TARDIS. Possibly, yeah. Although I do, I do like that uh, giddy, sugared up smile on her face. Mm -hmm. Look what I made! <laughs> yeah, the welding goggles and and that's also wearing uh, Peter Capaldi's clothes. Yep. Some of it, yet. Yeah. yeah. Oh so, yeah, the welding apron. Yep. Blacksmith or a, a yeah a a, a work a work apron, work goggles. And holding the sonic screwdriver aloft with a, basically a big shaded in grin. <laughs> yeah, yes, three setting. Knock it off, Bill. Bad Bill. Goes up to eleven. No, it okay. goes up to thirteen. <laughs> All right, so that's what we had for that. Kind of move on with the article. Yep. So uh, we also know the name of episode two for the season: the Ghost Monument. Still reeling from their first encounter, can the Doctor and her new friends stay alive long enough in a hostile alien environment to solve the mystery of desolation? And just who are Angstrong and Epso? Guest starring Sean Dooley, Susan Lynch, and Art Mal uh, either Malik or Malik, depending on I think it's history. Malik. Written by Chris Chibnall and directed by Mark Tonderai. Well, I would assume that Angstrom and Epso are either Sean Dooley... Susan Lynch or Art Malik, wouldn't you? <laughs> Seems uh, a logical assumption. All right. Uh, okay. That was so. just the right enough of a call and response that I had to stop myself from saying captain at the end. <laughs> All right. So let's move <laughs> on. Oh, is that more? Yep, that There's is There's another article for you, Bill. Yep. Come on. <laughs> I apparently didn't scroll down as far as I thought I had. <laughs> uh, we mentioned last week that the United States is getting Doctor Who in cinema on the 10th of October. Well, the announcement from Fathom Events is out now, and we know that it will be in cinema on both the 10th and 11th. The screening will include the following in addition to the episode. Becoming a Doctor. Follow Jodie Whittaker's journey from being cast in Doctor Who coming alive in her very first episode as the Doctor in this special bonus feature. And directing and regenerating Doctor Who. Meet the director of the Doctor Who premiere episode, Jamie Childs, and discover the unique challenges of bringing a new Doctor to the screen in Doctor Who. The runtime for the cinema event is 1 hour 30 minutes. All right. And so our, uh, if you're planning on going to see it in the in the cinema, that's uh you got 2 days to do it. Mhm. Mm this being a Fathom event, I'm guessing it's one uh, specifically one showing each day rather than... One to two. Mm -hmm. It depends on what theaters you're in. I know that here in Madison with our strong geek community, thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> Generally, uh, Point Cinema, which is the Fathom Events location, usually has to put in additional showing. Okay, because in, in my experience, I've only seen Fathom Events usually as, I think it's like a 7 p.m. showing. Yeah, usually it's like a 7 p.m., 7.30 but when they've sold out in like two to four cinemas for that um, they've occasionally gotten, yep, we're adding 9.30 showings now. Gotcha. On our final piece our Balchinian showrunner chatted with Big Issue North Magazine and in it just name dropped all the new pla uh, races and places we're going to see in series 11. We've been working hard at staying quiet until now in order that our audience audiences aren't spoilt and also that our stories make it onto television in the most exciting way possible. But now we're getting excited about showing you Epso, a life-changing bike ride. I don't know if that's... I don't know. I think that's a list, not a... Yeah, yeah this is a list. Yep. Okay, so I thought that was describing Epso. No, if it, no. If it was, I would have had semicolons. Right, yeah. I, that's what I get for not reading it before saying it. Uh, Epso, a life-changing bike ride, Robertson, the Ooks, Umbreen, Rosa, Desolation, Kandoka's Moon and Ribbons, or Kandoka's Moon and Ribbons. All of these things are on their way. Uh, we're, we have reason to believe that Rosa is referring to Rosa Parks, 
uh, the famous uh, civil rights activist, uh, as we had heard uh, a lot of speculation based on some of the sets we've seen, uh, as well as possible insider sources that she would be appearing in this season. Yeah. But we will see. All right. Um, Roberts, I'm trying to think. I feel like that's that name should have a specific meaning to me, but without the rest of the name, I'm not sure. Yeah, me neither. There's a few things that it could be, but I'm not sure yet. Okay. So now we have some cast and crew news. Uh, Jody was talking uh, recently with Stylist Magazine, talking about her version of the Doctor and its appeal. She said, There are no rules. You're an alien, but you're in a human body, so you can physically be anything. And that's the thing about this character. It fizzes out to every part of your body in a way I've never experienced. You're moving, either mentally or physically, constantly. So the energy that's required gives you this massive adrenaline rush. I wanted to play this doctor like a light going on in a cave for the first time. And the wonder that you find because every encounter is new. The friends, the worlds, the monsters. Everything is new. What an extraordinary thing, she is saying about being the first female doctor. Let, let it be a moment in history, but let it move forward to the extent it never gets talked about. That'd be ace. She also talked a bit about the recent Series 11 teaser, which shows her accidentally breaking a glass ceiling. Hmm. Now that I've put a little chink in my ceiling, I feel like the possibilities are endless. I would love to be in, West, in a Western. Shows like Godless and Westworld are extraordinary. I love those ensemble casts where every role is meaty and rich. Doctor Who is a huge box ticked for me, but would I want it to be the only time I tick a box? No. <sighs> so, moving on to uh, Bradley Walsh had been chit-chatting with the Radio Times this week about his upcoming character, Graham O'Brien. He had previously described Graham at San Diego Comic-Con as a regular bloke from London who ended up living in the north of England and gets taken away on this journey. It's like Jody is Captain Kirk and the, we're the rest of the guys on the bridge. I'm like Lieutenant Uhura. This time he was talking about initially getting the role. A week later, who's the doctor? Don't know. We haven't chosen them yet. And that went on and on and on. I said, how can I engage what I'm going to do with the part? And they said, you're going to be like an older companion and it's going to be a bit like the bridge on the Enterprise. It's going to be an ensemble piece. It's going to be like, and, I'm, and I went, I'm in, as soon as they said that, because I'm a massive Trekkie. I went, I'm in, I'm in, that's it, okay, done it. According to Jody, Graham is the more sedate of her companions. You've got these youthful, I'm counting myself in that, energized characters, and Graham is certainly the most cautious of the characters. He'd love a chair in every scene, and probably a sandwich. Bradley confirmed to Digital Spy, yes, these are massive interviews that went on all week, mm -hmm. that his character is not a comic relief character. I'm not sure the character, as developed, is based on my comedic experience, really. Our edict when we first joined was it had to be as real as possible. Everything comes from reality. Chib was my old boss on Law & Order, and I thought, I could bring gravitas to that, which was great for me because I, really, I didn't really want to be a clown. However, Jody seems to indicate otherwise to NME. Well, he's just a massive dickhead. He's absolutely hilarious, but there's so many moments where Brad would say something and he's reduced, to, reduced the three of us to tears. Mandy Bentosin are also hilarious, and it worked so well because we clicked into each other's humor. The best thing is that all of us have a sense of humor, so we can take the piss out of each other. We are very lucky to be in the, the, those jobs, and you can never be too serious if you've got bratters around. He's an absolute tit. It helps because you know what you are going to get. He's a TV show host, so you see his personality, but you just hope it isn't all souped up for TV, and in real life he's a grumpy old git. Thankfully not. He's like a child. He's the youngest and most immature person I've ever been around, yet he was still the grown-up among us four. So there you have it. I think she might be talking about when the camera's not rolling, whereas yeah. he's definitely talking about when it is. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to see for certain. 
Yeah, the fact that she's referring to them by the actors' names, not the right. character names, seem to be that. But it's it's kind of hard to tell. She doesn't say like so and so's character the way people will sometimes do in a BTS interview. She just says their straight name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get the feeling she's very much more talking about the actual like what goes on uh, when the when they're off screen or in between cuts. Well, the thing is, you know, that's the thing about sci-fi acting is you really break the stress from the, dr the drama off camera. Mm -hmm. um, who here have seen the outtakes from, like, star the uh, 2009 Star Trek? I have not. No. Uh, there's a scene where they blow a scene. Um, if, you know this, if you know the movie, it's when uh, Spock and Kirk are in the, the little ship that they found from older Spock. And they blow the they blow a line, and they just start going with it. And uh, I think the fact that it was either um, Kirk or, or it was either um, one of the two uh, did the did the line in the wrong accent, and so they just start going with it. Um, Spock, I'm trying to remember Zachary Quinto, starts doing a Scottish accent or Irish accent. And Chris Pine starts going in, like, you know, Saturday Night Live German. Hmm. You know, actually, now that you say that, I it rings a bell. I've either heard it described or I've seen a clip similar to that. And it finally ends with the scene where he turns the chair around. And you can hear Chris in the background going, turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it! <laughs> and finally he turns around and you just hear Star Trek Window go, fascinating! And it's just like, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Does, does a young version of Patrick Stewart pop out from behind the wall and yell at them? No. <laughs> that would be fantastic. But, you know, that's, and, you know, if you've ever heard stories about the Next Generation cast, apparently they did piss off uh, Patrick Stewart for being su mm -hmm. such unprofessional when the cameras weren't on. And, you know, so that's kind of, you know, the way things work. Right. Is you get to you get to horse around off camera as long as you can you know try to deliver your lines with a straight face when the cameras are on. Doesn't always work if several outtakes where people spontaneously break into laughter, but you know that's true with any movie. Yeah, but the bloopers that you'd get for Patrick Stewart after that first year. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Star Trek corrupted <laughs> Patrick Stewart ulti ultimately. <laughs> Of course, this is a person now that, you know, does stuff with, you know, frickin' Seth MacFarlane, so, you know, what the hell. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. A bit of update for a contest. We mentioned a couple of weeks about, ago about the Doctor Who Appreciation Society plans to have charity events to fund a blue plaque for William Hartnell. Well, the first of these plans is underway. Doctor Who Appreciate Society is auctioning off several signed photos and memorabilia on their eBay site, www.ebay.co.uk backslash USR slash DWAS underscore auction. Feel free to take a look and bid yourself. Speaking of which, let me look at that link really quick. There you have it. Auction underway. Uh, not giving me a lot of details about it though. Yeah, it looks like six items. Items for sale. There we go. Ooh. Yeah, look at those. Oh, they're roundel badges. I'm like, why does it look like an overhead view of beer pong? <laughs> <laughs> Round little badges, some Dalek art. Good stuff. Yeah. Oh, I see. They got multiple of these, so they're just selling. Yeah. Mm hmm. So it's all on Buy It Now, so you don't have to deal with the auction. Yeah, you can buy it now, and it's, some of it's not actually bad for price. Yeah, although if you buy it here, of course, you'll probably have to pay international shipping fees. Yeah. But that's the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Moving on. That's me, right? Yes. 
Uh, speaking of Dwas, they are planning a launch party for Series 11. All Doctor Who fans are invited to Saks Bar, Clifftown Road in South End on Sea. The venue is opposite the main, main railway station in Essex in Essex Town. The main bar will be open and the underground club has been reserved where the episode will be projected onto the big screen. The venue is open from 5 p.m. onward. Tickets are free, but you need to reserve them online at Eventbrite. You do not need to be a member of uh, DWAS to attend, but anyone who wishes to join can do so online. Fans are asked to support the event by buying a few drinks at the venue. We'd be there except South End on Sea is a bit far for any of us to travel. Sorry. Uh, speaking of screenings, the uh, British Film Institute will be screening the classic serial Earthshock Ooh. this November. The screening is on Saturday, the 17th of uh, November at, uh, yeah, 2018 at midday at the BFI on London's South Bank. This will be the new upscaled HD version, which is due for release as part of the season 19 Blu-ray release that weekend. Nice. You can purchase tickets from whatson.bfi.org.uk starting on the 25th of September. Which will be in a couple days. Yep, that's a week from yesterday. Well, yeah, yes. All right, moving on. Moving on to books. Specifically, candy jar books. Nope, not candy jar books. Nope. Or, Scroll uh, further or, down, uh, my good sir. Other. Down, other. Other, other, other books. Okay. Christopher Eccleston's memoirs, I Love the Bones of You, are planning to be published later this month by Simon & Schuster, UK. I think it's the book Schuster, detail... isn't it? Yeah. Schuster. Yeah, Schuster. Yeah. The book will detail the actor's life, starting with growing up in working-class Salford, being brought up to be factory fodder in the Northwest. He will talk about his desire to perform, which led him to his film debut, playing Derek Bentley in the 1991 film Let Him Have It. He will also talk about his breakthrough role in the BBC drama series Our Friends in the North, and of course, about his time as the Doctor when Doctor Who was relaunched in 2005. Eccleston will also talk about the loss of his father, who had dementia, and describe the struggles his family had to deal with in the condition over the past decade. No listing yet for a U.S. release. And okay. finally, our big finish news, which is all coming soon. Coming soon from Big Finish. Uh, so we have the Fourth Doctor Adventures, Series 8, The Syndicate Master Plan. Uh, the cover art is out now for that with new companion Ada Lovelace. Uh, this series also sees the return of third Doctor Era monsters, the Drashigs. I believe last seen in Carnival of Monsters and the occasional flashback. Correct. Uh, the Fourth Doctor Adventures Series 8, The Syndicate Master Plan, is available for pre-order now from the Big Finish website for £25 CD or $20 download per volume. And, of course, that's not the big news from Big Finish. Nope. So the big news is that apparently Michelle Gomez couldn't get enough of playing Missy for the Diaries of River Song. Now she signed on to her own series. Missy is available for pre-order from the Big Finish website for £23 CD, $20 download, until its release in February 2019, where the price will be increased to 35 CD, 30 download. We have no real details of what's in Missy as of yet. Uh, because, I mean, this just got announced, so mm -hmm. I'm surprised they have it slated for February if they're just announcing it now and don't have anything written or anything. Um, but we'll see. She's, All right. She's got the crazy hair from when we last saw her. Me well, I, I, think that, I think that might be a stock photo from Series 10. <laughs> It could just be that, but usually Dr. Uh, Big Finish is careful about that sort of thing. Sometimes they are. It also depends on whether they have other photos, because sometimes they use photos that very much don't match the stories they come out with. Hmm. I would have preferred a Series 9 photo, I think. Yeah, if it, if it wasn't supposed to be around that time. 
-hmm. Yeah, the the full on evil Mary Poppins look. Yeah. Uh, that said, it's possible that they had all these scripts written ages ago, but just finished negotiations. Yeah, that's uh, true. The glory of big, of big Finish is that she could literally just pop in there for the weekend and record three or four stories. Mm. And then they can just, you know, grab the other actors, do post, and put it out, the you know, the following week. So, I would like to sidebar for just a moment and say that uh, we had uh, Aaron's co-worker, the one that gives her a ride, over here last night. Um because she accidentally locked herself out of her apartment. But so uh, while killing time here, waiting for her roommate to call her back, um, we decided she was trying to finish up uh, series nine of Doctor Who. Yeah. Mm. And so we watched, it was the very last episode of series nine, the one uh, Hellbent. You all remember Hellbent, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, the one that ends with uh, uh, Clara and a Shilder flying off in the uh, uh, yes the 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 flying uh, American diner. diner, and I'm sitting here to myself watching this and thinking, why the hell is it Nick Briggs all over this? Why have we not heard coming soon from Big Finish, the adventures of? Clara think, and me. I think Jenna's keeping herself too busy. Hmm. Because her she seems to be popping up everywhere. Yeah, what she does she seem to be. To? She seems to be busy uh, with one thing after another. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure right around that time she was filming um that period piece, where she was a queen of some sort. Ah, uh, she was Victoria, wasn't she? I think she was, but I didn't want to say that. Yes, at uh. She was Victoria. With she the is with Victoria. The role. Yeah. She is, that is she still an is. ongoing okay. series. So that's part of it. Um, she's also in a series which is in pre-production named The Cry. Mm -hmm, but uh, that's only four episodes. four episodes. And four she was of. in. She was in one episodes of Thunderbirds Are Go. Um, but she even. Uh, she mentioned she even had, or somebody mentioned she even had trouble. Was it wait? Was that her that yeah, she was the one who had trouble getting away for the uh the latest episode, wasn't it? For the Christmas for twice. Yeah. yeah. It's possible. I don't remember, but yeah, if that was happening while that's filming. But still, you know, Big Finish is notorious for for going to an actress like, so you got a free weekend? True. But she might not have a free weekend. <laughs> also depends on where Victoria is being filmed. Um, wonder. It's okay. Victoria's filmed mostly in Yorkshire, so which I think is quite a bit from Cardiff. Well, as, as UK big, distances big, big go. finish doesn't um isn't necessarily Cardiff based. True, it's more London based, but even still, Yorkshire's in the north, so right. Yeah, apparently, um. Castle Howard in Yorkshire is what doubles for uh, Kensington Palace, and Harewood House stands for Buckingham Palace at the time, so that's why they're filming up there. So, yeah, it could just be that's a bit too far of a drive for her to come mm -hmm. down for a weekend and do some voice acting and come back. Normally, if you're filming a um, BBC or ITV series, you're probably filming in either London or Cardiff. And either place, Nick Briggs, you know, they have, you know, it's like Big Finish has a main office near London and a satellite office in, in uh, um, Cardiff, so. Because hmm. I'm sure even Nick Briggs had to apparently probably do some audio acting in Cardiff uh, when he's also on set being a Dalek mm -hmm. or a Cyberman yeah. or a whatever. But yeah, we he's don't usually even there to do the lines and also give signals he, to the guys who are turning on the lights. He also seems to do a lot of recruiting there. I noticed that the BTS for the Condemned, um, that two of the actors had appeared in unrelated episodes of Modern Who. Oh, yeah. Mm. I think oh, yeah. every time someone walks into the office, he confronts them with a clipboard. Yep. Pretty much. Um, so, by the way, um, on the note of Nicholas Briggs, apparently... According to Wikipedia, he is still um, listed to present 
as being in the Doctor Who production, but I don't know if that's fully true or if that's just legacy. They just haven't Wikipedia. said that they officially fired him yet or not, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, if he's there, he's the only person returning from that, and we know that there's no Daleks this season, and there's no Cybermen. But there are monsters. There are monsters, yes. There's got to be monsters of some kind, yeah. Yeah, but that does not necessarily mean that they'd have to get Nick, Nick Briggs to voice them. Not necessarily, I mean, that's, that's... but... Does anybody else in Cardiff remember how to voice a monster? Oh, I'm pretty sure I they th could find somebody. I, did they come I, with their I, own I, microphone? Yeah, I, I know they occasionally have other people do a Cyberman or whatever, but... No, it's just, you know, the if Nick Briggs is still doing monster voices for Doctor Who, that means he's like the only cast member that returns from the from the original run, so... I am immortal. I would say him and the TARDIS, but they have uh, they have recast the TARDIS. With a yeah, they, they've redesigned the exterior and the interior, so they've basically just recast it. God damn it, stop, recast, or stop remodeling my TARDIS. I really loved that last set. All right, so who wants to do the episode summary? I guess it's my turn, isn't it? It's sure. technically yours or Bill's. I'm pretty sure Bill did it before I have last. Because it's been a while for me. Because yeah, I believe I me and Tim went the last couple ago. times, so... Actually, no, did... Actually, I'm trying to remember now. Did actually Bill do it last time? I, I did the first big finish we had. Okay. That would have been two weeks ago. Then I believe I did it last week, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, I did, I did it last week, so yeah, it's down to actually Randy and Tim. And I'm pretty sure Tim did it before me, too. Mm-hmm. Because I know I, I I haven't done it since before GeekCon, so. Mm hmm All right, so why don't you go ahead and get your stopwatch open? I'm ready anytime you are. All right, um, give me a countdown. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so we pick up this one pretty much where we left off in the last audio drama, where Charlie stranded in uh, what was it, the year five hundred thousand and two? Something like that. Yeah. is picked up, uh, is sending out a Morse code distress signal, and the TARDIS materializes, and she opens it up, thankful, and waiting to see the Doctor, only it's the wrong Doctor. Instead, of course, she uh, meets the sixth Doctor, Colin Baker, and after a very awkward opening, introduces herself as Charlotte Smith. The doctor is very suspicious of Charlie, and uh, but still consents to try to take her home, and the TARDIS eventually materializes in 21st century London. Right where they left. Pretty much near where they left, but not in the same building, and looking outside in the scanner, they see a dead body. Well, of course, uh, Charlie's all gung-ho to go out and investigate, which also is setting off the doctor's uh, uh, warning bells. And when they go out and take a look and they decide that they need to contact the police, uh, Charlie picks up a phone and goes, Operator, operator, and uh, gets a deadline. So she has to run off and look for a phone that's working. Well, it seems the police had already been notified, but Charlie doesn't realize that. The doctor finds out really quick after the uh, police pull out their megaphones and start announcing, uh, you know, doing the whole police bit. The doctor complies and is promptly arrested by one of our other characters. Uh, what was that? Uh, D.I. What was her name? Was it Mendez? Menzies. Menzies. Men Menzies. D.I. Menzies, who... Uh, takes the body and the doctor in for uh, questioning. To them, it's an open and shut case. They've got a body, a corpse, and somebody standing over it. I mean, you know, that's pretty much... Um, you're, going to, you're going to go away for a long time. Meanwhile, Charlie recovers consciousness where she had been apparently knocked unconscious, and she is chained to a bed. A young lady is there and oh seems to be polite... Um, in talking to her, and eventually she manages uh, to get Charlie some food, in this case some Indian curry, which Charlie notices is inferior. And they begin asking her questions on what happened in the room. 
Of course, she doesn't know anything, but they don't believe her. Meanwhile, at the police station, the doctor manages to uh, tell the, uh, the DI some information um, to check the back of the neck of the person, and they find basically what looked to be a chip in the back of the neck. When removed, suddenly the whole body changes. Um, and it is an alien coming back to question the doctor. The doctor manages to uh, uh, get himself involved in the investigation, which starts a basically series of questioning, which is a true on detective mystery. If you ignore the fact that most of that the victim and most of the people involved are aliens. Meanwhile, Charlie starts getting calls from a person named Sam, which is weird because all the phones are dead. Sam doesn't know where he is and seems to be trapped somewhere in the building's basement. Charlie eventually escapes, goes down to the basement, but does not find Sam. Menzies and the doctor eventually question the victim's wife, who seems to be estranged from her husband, and also a few other people, um, which all leads them back to the same house, which was Ackley House. Um, it is then discovered that Sam had been the one to kill our victim, um, and opened a briefcase, which the doctor had found by the, uh, by the body, which apparently contained a form of radiation which altered his, phys his physiology and merged him with the house itself. The person involved in this was a man by the name of Slater, who is another alien, who basically wants to use this particular ability, this radiation involves, to basically take over the Earth. Because, of course, it can't be a Doctor Who episode with somebody tr without somebody trying to take over the Earth. Of course. Uh, he eventually shows up with what he claims to be as the antidote, but is really just a giant bomb. Um, however, Sam, overhearing this and realizing their plans to ki basically kill everyone in the building, works with them to construct a plan to trap um, Slater in the elevator and talks the victim's wife, who was the one that hired Sam to kill her husband, into killing Slater so that they would be on the same par. She later turns herself into the police, and with everything wrapped up, the doctor and Charlie basically get out of there before the fingers start being pointed back at them. On their way out, the doctor basically reveals to the fact that uh, he was aware that Charlie is from somewhere in the early 20th century, but Charlie managed to convince him that she has amnesia and basically would like to travel with him until she figures things out. The doctor doesn't fully believe her, but concedes. And that's pretty much where the episode left off. Six minutes. Yeah, it's kind of a convoluted episode. Yeah. Because I had to cut stuff out. <laughs> All right. So... Let's talk about what we liked about the episode. And Matt, you are first. Oh, I, I loved the mystery of the story. Oh, just God, like, yes. Right off the top. Just yes. so many layers to work through, and it's all really intriguing stuff mm -hmm. all the way through. You know, I'm, I'm writing Doctor Who fan fiction. One of the things I want to do is a traditional mystery somewhere in there. You know, actual, mm -hmm. like, plot points. I'm not sure if it would be more Holmesian or film noir or something, but a traditional traditional yeah. mystery style done in with Doctor Who characters. And this was a traditional mystery. Mm -hmm. It was more of a police procedural, but it was still awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. I really loved it. All right, Bill, how about you? Uh, so what I like is that this could very easily have been an episode about Menzies freaking out every five minutes and they made the conscious decision to make sure that did not happen. You get the you get the feeling that Menzies was just kind of filing it to freak out about it later. Kind of. It's just like, okay, I'm on the job, I've got to do this. 
-hmm. Okay, aliens are real. Okay, yada, yada, yada. I'll deal with that later. Just file it, go right. to work. <laughs> and in, in the midst of, like, this whole, like, men in black revelation they've got going on, it really worked. It did. Because, yeah, you think about this, and you think of Will Smith in the same role. He would be mm -hmm. fucking freaking out. That's what Jay did yeah. in Men in Black. But instead we got British. You just take it, you move on. Keep calm and carry on. Yep. 12 on the freaky shit -a meter <laughs> All right, Tim, how about you? Oh, I really liked uh, the... Uh... I guess uh, the basic ideas of uh, the aliens among us angle and how it was presented uh, to, and I'm, I'm thinking this uh, uh, the, this is an a aspect of uh, Doctor Who uh that that could be explored more more in, in other episodes well at the yeah. time and i mean this was done what 2008 mm -hmm. um the aliens among us thing was the was the really big thing of torchwood mm -hmm. so at the same time this was kind of like big finish does torchwood without torchwood and I could pretty much picture Jack and Gwen in uh, the Doctor and Clara's roles. Well, no, because they wouldn't have needed the police. Like, they just would have roofied her and mm -hmm. gone about their business. But then she probably would have shown up again. Yeah. And, you know, if this had been Torchwood, she would have been a potential recruit, too. Mm -hmm. She's taking this well. I mean, basically, her role is freaking... Um, um, Gwen in episode one. Yeah, Gwen in episode one. She's a police detective who finds out all of this freaky shit and won't put it down. Right. So, yeah. That was uh, kind of interesting. All right. So what I really liked, I think the uh I really started to like the the team up of uh Colin Baker and India Fisher because it was just kind of interesting to see the doctor deal with somebody who was already a veteran. I mean, you take a look at the doctor, the six doctors other companions, you've got Perry who was a veteran mm -hmm. barely. Mhm. Mm when when the six doctors started and then had to deal with the sixth doctor starting, mm -hmm. which would have stressed anybody out. And then you had Mel, who was a veteran and then a rookie. Mm hmm. <laughs> so now you get Charlie, who was already a seasoned veteran. And I have just... no idea what Frober Frobisher was like as a rookie. I only, I've only seen I don't him as count a Frobisher really <laughs> because I, you've never saw him in the live action. So. Mm. I'm also keeping... Uh, so you don't count the best companion either? Hmm. Evelyn. Uh, yeah, because, again, uh, she was made solely for Big Finish, so therefore you get to see her start her arc and finish her arc. Well, kind of had to because the actress died, but still. Anyway, you got to see those finish, and... Mm. Uh, huh. But, you know, just seeing somebody dropped in that already knew everything, it would be like if Jamie had actually fully started traveling with the Doctor again, mm -hmm. uh, rather than just cameoing. Well, actually, it seems like they pointed out that she doesn't know everything because she doesn't understand uh, who this Doctor is, at least at first. Yeah, well, she's thrown for a loop by that, mm -hmm. but she recovers nicely. It's, yeah, it's, and she had, she had seen regeneration before, so she, it's pretty quick that she realizes that this is another version of the Doctor. Who doesn't recognize her? So I think by the end of it, she's figured out it's an earlier doctor. Yeah, I was going to ask: uh, Is she uh, uh, familiar with the concept of regeneration? By going through Zagreus and everything, yes. Yeah, she's been to Gallifrey uh... at least <clears throat> once, possibly more times. Yeah. Okay. That and the fact that the Time Lords don't like her. 
<laughs> because she's a big freaking temporal paradox. She's not supposed to be alive. She was supposed to have died on the R101, and the doctor took her off, and that's it created a paradox. Um, so, yeah, the Time Lords aren't very fond of Charlie, just to let you know. Um, paradox, but a very minor one at that, though. All right, so let's move on to what we disliked about the episode. Matt, you're first. Disliked about the episode. I will admit that does get a little long-winded in some parts. Mm, it didn't really bother most of the me, though. Most of the time, it's the per I'm perfectly fine with it, and I'm trying to find a nitpick here, and I will admit that there are some parts where it's just like, yes, we already can feel you twirling your mustache. Get on with it. In particular, uh, during one of the uh, scenes towards the later ha quarter. Mm -hmm. All right. Bill, how about you? I feel like the doctor was just not suspicious enough of Charlie. I mean, <laughs> she wasn't shocked to see the TARDIS. She wasn't shocked to see the inside of the TARDIS. She had time traveled before. If I were the sixth doctor, considering his run, even if you only count live action... I would think she was an agent of the Time Lords sent to spy on him or manipulate him. And she um, really has no reason to think otherwise other than the fact that she doesn't... I mean, she's obvious, she, she doesn't have two hearts, but there's other ways around that. I don't think the Sixth Doctor was that suspicious of the Time Lords. Um, I mean, You've I been away from them for a while at that point. I yeah. seem to... I mean... Eh, I mean, again, I, yeah. If, if, I mean, if they want to manipulate... Finish, he had gone other arcs, but between... Uh, Attack of the Cybermen when he like early on was like oh fuck the the Time Lords put me here to fuck with things mm -hmm. and then he went through the trial of the Time Lords again just fucking around with shit and then blaming him mm -hmm. but they weren't actually out to get him they weren't actually out to get him and they didn't uh, if they wanted him to do something they would just push him there anyways and just, he'd be grumpy about it across his arms have a fit and then mm -hmm. go about his business <laughs> Yeah, it's really, by the way, if you don't know the mythos, there's only really one branch of the Time Lords that would be actively manipulating the Doctor, and that's the Celestial Intervention Agency, mm -hmm. which was formed apparently... Yeah, that's yep. it, the CIA, and it was... Yes, it, the it, name was made as a pun on the U.S. Yes, it was uh, formed, by the way, as a result of the second Doctor's trial in the War Games. Ah, uh, figures of them basically going, okay, yeah, there's shit fucked up with, with, with bad guys fucking with stuff, and yeah, sometimes it needs somebody needs to deal with it. So the so the CIA was formed for them to covertly deal with this kind of shit. And of and course, favorite, they'd be the first one their, to poke them. <laughs> it was the Celestial Intervention Agency that pulled the fourth Doctor to Scarrow with the intention of stopping the progress on the creation of the Daleks, which worked just wonderfully, didn't it? <laughs> Yeah. Delayed, delayed it was, things by a century or so. <laughs> it was a member of the CIA who popped in on the third doctor to let him know the master was on the loose. Mm hmm And it was probably the CIA which plopped him on Telos to deal with uh, the Cybermen gaining access to time travel. It's also possible that it was the CIA that created the Valyard as a weapon to use against the doctor in the first place. It's in not... Big Finish only canon, which yeah. this is Big Finish. This is Big Finish, and I, I, to be honest, I like that ending. It's a decent ending for the Sixth Doctor. Mm. Um, it's it's more realistic than Oops Bump on the Head. <laughs> but what we had seen is the fact that um, the CIA wasn't the only one screwing stuff up. The High Council was pretty freaking corrupt while, yeah. by this point. Right. Yeah. And was doing back end dealings, stuff the CIA the CIA would not approve of, but they're the high council. What the fuck are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. They're not gonna tell the council to do shit. Mm -hmm. They they probably existed because of the council, so they're just zip our mouths for now. We'll clean up the mess later. And in retrospect, was probably doing this stuff, and this is using hindsight because there was probably a shadow war going on at that point between the Time Lords and the Daleks. Mm-hmm kind of a Cold War going on, which of course eventually led into the Great Time War. Yep. But I think at this point, I don't think the Sixth Doctor would be immediately suspicious of the Time Lords uh, trying to plant an agent on him. Because they don't really need to bother. 
Possibly, mm-hmm. but I still think if a time traveler who seemed very much like she was lying and was not surprised by seeing the inside of a TARDIS came around, I think he'd be... He, was suspe- he wasn't was suspicious enough for to make sense to me. Okay. It seemed like they were more letting pacifying him for the sake of the story than actually giving him reason to be pacified. Well, I tried to dissuade you, but you are entitled to your opinion. Mm-hmm. Tim, how about you? What did you dislike about the episode? I disliked how for like the premiere episode of Charlie and the Sixth Doctor Adventures, uh, they meet, and then they almost immediately get separated, and for the majority, the Doctor is uh, off with someone else. Now, I I grant you that someone else, uh, D.I. Menzies, uh, is quite a fascinating character in her own right, but I would have liked to have seen uh, Charlie and the Doctor spend a little bit more time together mm-hmm. in, their, uh, in their first outing together. Mm-hmm. I'll agree to that. It almost seems like this was a story written just in in general, like for somebody else, and then they were like, well, we're also going to make it a companion intro. Whoops. Oh, well. Go for it. Whee! Yeah, it's like they just decided, oh, yeah, we should probably... um, We should probably use this as a vehicle for Charlie. Let's rewrite this slightly. We'll see. Oh, we already lost right. that companion. Oh, he's got the, this new companion. We might as well rewrite it for that. I'm wondering if this was meant for... Uh, hang on. Um, I, it sounds if this was me- meant to be like a Sixth Doctor and Evelyn. Maybe. But... It, it, almost, it almost reads like a... It, it definitely reads like it could be a Perry episode to me. I don't know if it was, but it... I think you could replace Charlie with Perry and it would fit very well. Possibly. Well, I'm wondering if this was about the point that... Uh, um, oh, no, wait, no. Blue Coat would have to be Evelyn at this point, wouldn't it? Because this is only a second Blue Coat companion he'd had. Um. Okay, no. This was 2009, so Maggie Stables was still... Uh, going strong. She had to stop acting in 2013 because oh, she had the saying. illness. In, so, the, yeah. in, in the behind the scenes, he mentions that um, his regular stable are Mel, Perry, and Evelyn. So I mm. figured they were all active, but considering the blue coat is written into the plot, unless that was a rewrite... That, that could have also been a rewrite, episode. too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It Just could saying. be a rewrite, definitely. Just saying, the, the the big finish is trying to keep its own continuity at the very least, and they'd probably notice that at note two. Yeah. Although they they definitely make mistakes, like when Sophie Aldred isn't sure how old the version of Ace she's playing is supposed to be. <laughs> We're not saying they're perfect. We're saying they try to catch most of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whether she's playing young Ace or older Ace. Right. I guess that's an issue with the uh, the new Mel stories, where she's not sure if it's. Old Ace, or, or like if it's old Mel or uh, yeah, Mel like that's past all that, Ace or like yeah, yeah, it's kind of hard to tell because a lot of those companions left and mm-hmm. then joined them years later so that they could you know age up there because their their voice actors are having problems doing mm-hmm. the younger versions of themselves. All like right, it, yeah, well, yeah. So what I didn't like about the episode is the whole concept of radiation sucking someone into a building. Yeah, they didn't explain that very well, did they? Yeah, uh, it, it's just, oh yeah, there's this magical radiation we created that basically turns you into... What is this, even Evangelion? Even Gellion you, sounds a little you're, you're, more grounded than your this. Your body dissolves into LCL, which imbues into the building? I mean, come on. Uh, is that just... what happened in that um, in that series ten episode with the girl? Mm. Like, I'm not actually sure what happened with that episode. To be, it's been a while, but series ten episode like the, with the girl, the the, the other haunt, the, the actual haunted house episode. Just, uh, th- this idea seems very familiar. Like, I, I get the vague feeling that this was like a Star Trek episode. I don't know, but. My also my big deal on it is the doctor's immediate response of yeah this is irreversible sorry 
it's just, you know, he doesn't even try. And it's just, I don't know, the whole thing just really hit me as being kind of, eh. Honest I took to that. God. I took that partially as being a six doctor thing because as yeah. a rule, he's he's not a hundred percent a dick, but he's still a lot more callous than the other doctors. And and he'll be a lot more upfront about it. I'm probably I'm pretty sure you can't be like, saved, kind of deal. Yeah. Like most of the doctors, if they're ninety nine percent sure, they'll go for that one percent. Whereas he'll be like, sorry. Yeah, I know. It's just the whole the whole concept itself seemed a bit ludicrous to me. Mm-hmm. And it then is. it's like, and then on top of it was the, yeah, I'm not even going to try to fix it. I'm just like. Well, at least yeah. they're trying to prevent you from being completely murdered by a bomb. Mm-hmm. And he, and he spends, he spends the rest of his life as being Siri to the rest of the, the rest of the people in this building. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like. Sam, can you play Sympathy of the Devil for me? <laughs> you know, I mean, what else is he going to do with the rest of his life? Yes. All right. So, what was your favorite scene? And Matt, you're first. Ah, uh, favorite scene. Um. Oh, so many really good ones to go with. Um, actually, I'm gonna go with uh, uh, one of the better ones was the Charlie scene where she manages to break free on her own. Uh, the uh, cuffs got rusted by, I believe it was Sam. We find out later. Um, she manages to take out the girl that's been keeping her captive in the bedroom. Uh, takes the phone, takes the key. Uh, and I believe there's something else, and she warns the girl, please don't try to do anything foolish. I don't want to knock you out. Believe me, I've been knocked out already today. It doesn't feel good when you come back out of it. And as she's about to leave, the girl tries rushing her anyways, and she knocks her out. <laughs> and just, just all the way out the door. I'm sorry, I warned you, I'm sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Alright. Bill? Um... Uh, I, wish, I always, even when I have a scene, I always forget it when you ask me. Um, God damn it, Bill. Go on, I'm going to try to remember it. Sorry. Tim? I just uh, really liked the scene where it's revealed that uh, the husband and wife had this insurance company, and the doctor is all like, oh, of course, it's all it has to do with money. Like, that was a... I think that was a brilliant uh, Sixth Doctor moment. Yeah, and I'm going to have to go with you on that scene, but for different reasons. Because this is the point, it, it's the point where the detective, i.e. the Doctor, makes all the grand reveals and links it all together, and that's always my favorite scene in a mystery. Mm -hmm. Where it's, I know who killed our victim... I know, who stuck in the walls. <laughs> I know who killed Mr. Body. It was you all the time, wasn't it, Professor Plum? Yeah, you know, that's that's the moment I wait for. And so I love that scene because that's the that's the that's the grand detective reveal of him just absolutely going putting all the pieces together. So that's what I liked. You figured one out yet, Bill? My original was Tim's choice, and I can't think of one that I like even close to as much. Ugh. So I'm just going to have to ba agree with him on that. Yeah, I think that's the three of us all chose the same scene. Mm -hmm. God damn it, people. There's more scenes that were good. Well, take a second if you want. Well, mind you, I like that same scene for a different reason, so, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. The, the big alien reveal scene for the police officer, there's... Uh... Mm -hmm. That was like my that was my second choice. Uh, Charlie going into the basement. Wasn't that fond uh, of that scene? Oh, that the was that was like, ooh, what's the this? Alien. Ooh, the mystery deepens for me. You mean the scene where she chooses not to go to the basement? Where she goes to the basement, finds out that even though she has a lighter lit, that it's not producing light, and she freaks mm -hmm. out and runs. All right. So, what is your least favorite scene? Oh gosh, least favorite scene. Um, 
I think it's when we figure out that that uh, I forget the, the 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 like the business guy, the uh, the one they just met in the last act, and like I said, he he as soon as we, the, the police officer is talking to him alone, I instantly get the sensation of him twirling his mustache. It's just like, come on, he's like one of the main villains. Obviously, he's one of the main villains, and sure enough, he's the main villain, and he's going to try and kill everybody. I'm I just like you could have just stopped wasting time. <laughs> All right. Well, the doctor had to figure out who he was. Bill. Nah. Uh so I'm actually going to go with the alien reveal scene and this is because one of my pet peeves is when they skip 5 minutes of the show and then something that would have been shown on screen if they hadn't skipped that ends up being a big reveal because it just feels cheap and lazy and just it feels like you've been cheated out of the knowledge rather than giving you a chance to actually enjoy it. Mm. Like this is something that we should have seen the doctor lean down and be like, what's this? This is strange. Instead, it's just, nope, they skip over that time and then he tells the the inspector and it's it feels like you're cheated out of it. Mm. Yeah, that would have been great for him to note that and then even if he didn't say what it was, even if just remark something was there. All right. Tim, how about you? I uh just didn't like the scene where just as uh, the doctor and Menzies are getting somewhere, Menzies' superiors come in and like just throw the wrench in the works. Yeah, thank Th- you. That, that was Grindy well. too. Yeah, that was the, the J. Jonah Jameson as a police de- a detective and or a chief inspector. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he uh, annoyed a the hell. That's cliche of a moment too. Yeah, yeah, it really is. The, the the police detective that basically wants the uh, fully believes in uh, Akram's razor. Like, yeah, you're there with the body. You're guilty. You're going to go to jail. Goodbye. I'm like... And this is not how the justice system works, children. Turnbull. That's the guy. Turnbull. Um... Oh, God. He's basically just Harvey Bullock with a uh as as a british cop i'm just like no don't like him the fact that he also has the tenacity of a rabid wolverine bothered me too <laughs> like every time he spoke i swear i could see spittle f- falling out <laughs> of his mouth i'm like jesus no such a freaking cliche mm-hmm. fortunately he's only in two scenes so Again, Jonah Jameson, but yeah. All right, so that was mine as well. So now we move on to final thoughts. Okay, so that goes back to me. Uh, Mm -hmm. I have to say all my negatives on this one are more or less nitpicks, except for maybe one or two scenes. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this one pretty fondly for the most part. Um, really good mystery that keeps you involved for the entire story. Uh, our main cast does a pretty good job of being believable as as the characters they're cast for. Of course, some of them are seasoned veterans at this point. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it was a f- pretty good first start, other than a few little nitpicks about it. All right, Bill. It's a. It was annoying me at first, and then as the episode went on, I found myself more and more um, engrossed in it and enjoying it more. Uh, I still have some issues with it in terms of the whole companion entry thing, Uh, but overall, I think it came out to a pretty good story. A little bit convoluted, but not bad. All right. Tim? This was a nice mystery uh, and a good uh, show by uh, Colin Baker here. Like I said, uh, I wish uh, Charlie had been uh, uh, integrated into the story uh, better. 
better and had some more time and like to get to to develop a rapport and relationship with uh, with the sixth doctor. But other than that, I found this a highly entertaining episode. All right. So as for me, I liked it more more or less. There were a few things that bothered me. Um, but other than that, I really enjoyed the mystery aspect of it. I really enjoyed the uh um I really enjoyed the um uh, um the doctor and Charlie. I just enjoyed a good chunk of it. Um So yeah. I just uh I more I, I I enjoyed it not completely but good enough that I would recommend it. All right, ratings. Matt, you're first. I'm just going to straight up say 4. All right. Bill, I'm not entirely confident in this rating, but I feel like other people will probably balance it out to closer to the other option anyway. But so for now I'm going to say a 3. 3 flat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bill's back to being our like critical. Three point two. Uh, Tim. Well, this wasn't uh, er, <laughs> uh, time lash, so I'm gonna give it a zero. No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, uh I will uh, give this a four and a half. Ooh. Point five. And I agree with Matt, and we'll give this a four. Which balances this out to a 3.9. 3.88, technically. Nine. Um, and that will put us not too high, but not too low. C, column D, reverse that, and at a 3.9, actually, that's fairly high, um, uh, The Condemned is at number 130 of 262 things reviewed, putting it just, just barely in the top half. Just barely in the just top half. Just about the middle, yep. It is on par with uh, knock Knock, The Deadly Assassin, The Brain of Morbius, Colony in Space, Warrior's Gate, Revenge of the Slovene, Into the Dalek, Technophobia, Monster of Peladon, Blink, The Next Doctor, The Chase, Gardens of the Dead, uh, Jago and Lightfoot Revival, It Is Better Than, Keeper of Traken, Boomtown, Ghost Light, Invasion of the Bane, Enemy of the World, Girl in the Fireplace, End of the World, Daleks Invasion Earth 2150, Day of the Daleks, etc. And is worse than A Good Man Goes to War, Attack of the Cybermen, Runaway Bride, Vengeance on Veros, Trial of the Valyard, Heaven Sent, Terminus, Everything Changes, The Invisible Enemy, etc. So there you go. 130 out of 262. That is all we have to say about The Condemned. Yep. ta -da. Take us out, Bill. All right. Uh, don't forget to uh, follow us on Twitch and uh, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, leave your like or dislike and comment with you know your opinion on the episode. You can also follow us at facebook.com slash unearthlypodcast and twitter.com slash unearthlypod uh, for updates on new uploads. And you can also uh, support us at patreon.com slash unearthlypodcast. All right, so next week we conclude this season of an unearthly podcast with the final part of our uh, companion intro and leave, and we say our final goodbye to Charlie as she leaves the Sixth Doctor finally. At in Blue Forgotten Planet, written and directed by Nicholas Briggs, mm. and starring Colin Baker as the Doctor and India Fisher as Charlotte Charlie Pollard. See you next week. Good night. Good night. Bye bye.